Amen. God's love. God's love for us. That even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you. That's his love for us. Sometimes it's a love that, <laughs> in all honesty, is controversial. How could God love somebody like him? How could God forgive somebody like him? They did this, they did that. Sometimes we question it. Sometimes the world questions. Well, that's God's love. How could God righteously forgive somebody? But because of his love, because of the cross of Jesus, he's brought us back into relationship with him. He wants us so badly in relationship with him. He wants us so close to him, so badly, that he would do something that's controversial, that would make people question, make people wonder. But it's true. The love of God is true. It is just and it is righteous because Jesus paid the price. God desired so much to have relationship with us, to bring us back into relationship with him that he said, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to send my only son, Jesus. I'm going to send him to pay the price that all humans deserved. The price of death. The blood that was shed, the body that was broken, that was our punishment that Jesus took upon himself. And he said, I'll gladly do it because of the joy that is set before me, us being in relationship again with him. We're going to take just a couple of minutes here and remember we're going to take communion. Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed and the night that he started his journey to the cross, before all of that, he met with his disciples one last time. They ate together. They had bread. They had grape juice. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the bread. And that's what we're going to do today. So if you guys have prepared <clears throat> bread and grape juice or whatever you have available, go ahead and take that now. We're going to do this as a church family, remembering the love of Jesus, the love of God who sacrificed for us so that we can be brought into relationship with him. Thank you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it with his disciples. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take this and eat it. Do it in remembrance of me. And we see that was the first night that they did it. But Jesus said, continue to do this. And we see in the book of Acts, they uh, met together and they had communion together. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we do to remember what Jesus has done for us. It's a partaking of fellowship with him. It's, it's coming into that relationship again and remembering the price that he paid, but remembering the place that we have in him. So let's, let's pray together. Let's honor Jesus. Let's lift Jesus up in our hearts and in our minds. Let's give him the place that he rightly deserves because he is the king above all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. His name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provision that you have made for us. Jesus, we lift you high. We lift you high to your rightful place above all else above ourselves, above our lives, above our circumstances, it's you. And we stop and we remember the price that you paid for us, 
the body that was broken, the blood that was shed, so that we can come into relationship with you. And we never have to be afraid of, of being outside anymore. We don't have to be wandering in the darkness anymore, but we come in faith to you, to truth, to life, to light. All that you have for us is all that we receive from you. You don't hold anything back. You've given us everything. And today, as an act of faith, we partake of, of, of the bread and of the, of the grape juice, and we say, God, yes, yes, count me in. Count me in. I remember, count me as part of what you have. Lord God, we take this today in faith, and, we, and, and with hearts of thankfulness, we take it. And we remember, let us never, ever forget what you have done, Jesus, for us. In your name we pray, amen. Go ahead and take the bread and drink the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, God. With hearts of thankfulness, we thank you. We praise you for your provision, for the price that you've paid. You are our king. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys so much. Amen. What a sweet time in the presence of God. Hope you guys, everyone out there, whether you're watching on your phone or on your TV, whether you're by yourself or with your cell group or your family, hope you guys enjoyed the presence of God as much as we did. God's goodness to us is not bound by four walls, but it can go to cafes or houses or wherever you're watching today. I, it's pretty cool. I've been in contact with people from different countries around the world, people uh, who, who, who've been watching with us, and there's been people from Australia watching, and the Netherlands, and uh, where else? Canada, America, different countries all around the world, people watching, Netherlands even, watching the services with us, and I hope that you receive from the presence of God, are encouraged, are blessed, just like we're, we are, and we just pray God's great blessings on you. We've been going through a, a series that we started a few weeks ago on love. And we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, 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 classic, uh, the classic chapter on love, where Paul talks about this is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. And then the whole list of things where, where he's talking about love. And before we get into today's message on love, I could just kind of want to remind us kind of where we've come from since the beginning of the year. The beginning of the year, we started a series on the Ten Commandments. And in that series on the Ten Commandments, we were talking about each one of the commands, about the principles that are in there in the, from the Bible. But the main overall message in that is that the commands were given so that we could live in good relationship. And the commands are broken down into two groups. The first group talks about our relationship with God. The second part of it talks about our relationship with others. And just like we sang about today, and just like we experienced while we did communion, we're talking about our relationship with God and our relationship with others. And God, Jesus summarized the Ten Commands in a, series of verse, in a series of two commands. The first one, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself. And so in that, Jesus said, these are two overall overarching commands. Love God, 
love others. He summarized all of the commands of Scripture in those two commands. Love God. I mean, think about the Ten Commands. Okay, thou don't have any other gods before me. Don't have any graven images. All of those things. It's talking about our relationship with God. And the second part of the commands is talking about our relationship with others. Do not steal. Do not covet. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. All of those things deal with our relationship with each other as well. And so we see that Jesus summarized everything in love God and love others. And so in this series that we're talking about, we see how important love is to relationships. And in order to have good relationships, God encourages us to think about those relationships and love and honor and do all of these things so that we can have good relationships with other people. So in this series, we've talked about love is patient. Okay, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago and how love is, thinks about the long game, not just today, not just the things that happen today, but it has faith. It has faith for what God can do. It also has faith for what God can do in other people. It doesn't just take one little shot, a little snapshot of what today holds, but it looks at the big picture. It says, okay, here's what the future holds, and it's faith. It, love is full of faith, and love is future-focused. Love is kind. We talked last week about how love is kind. It looks to, how, to see how can we bless others, how can we help others, how can we be a blessing to others. And last week, we talked about the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth didn't have anything to offer to King David, but King David said, who can I show kindness to from the house of Saul? Who can I show kindness to because of my relationship with Jonathan? Who can I show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? And so because of his relationship with Jonathan, King David looked around and said, all right, here's Mephibosheth. He's a cripple. He doesn't have anything to offer. He can't go where he wants to go. He can't do what he wants to do. He needs people to help him around. But... He's going to be sitting at my table. He's going to have the inheritance of a king. And I'm going to show him kindness because of my relationship with Jonathan. And that's very similar to how God shows kindness to us. Because of what Jesus did, the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross, we can have that relationship with God. We have the inheritance of a king because of what Jesus did. And we can, in turn, show that same kindness to others because of what God did for us. Because of who God is to us. So because of who God is and what Jesus did on the cross for us, we can then show kindness to other people. Today we're going to talk about a few more points from, uh, from this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. But I wanna, I'm going to read the whole passage in 1 Corinthians 13 to start off. So 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And verse 8 says, Love never fails. So as I said, we talked about love is patient and love is kind. Today we're going to talk about love does not envy, love does not boast, love does, is not proud. When we look at the word envy, the word envy that's used here is very similar to the word in the Old Testament that's used for covet. Covet, we talked about this when we were talking about the Ten Commands, thou shalt not covet, uh, in the Tenth Command there. And covet has the idea of wanting something that somebody else has. It's being jealous of what they have and what I don't have. There's a story in Acts chapter 17. When, when Paul, when he traveled to Thessalonica, uh, it's the, the, the church that 
the book of First and Second Thessalonians was sent to. As he went to that city, he went and he went into the synagogue, which was his habit. He would go into the synagogue. And you have to understand that Thessalonica was in a Greek, it was in the, the country of Greece. And it is not a Jewish country. It is a Gentile country. So people who are not descendants from Abraham, but they, have, they had a Jewish synagogue, which would be like a Jewish church in that city. And so Paul and his, Paul went in, as was his custom, it says in verse two, uh, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 2, and on three Sabbath days, so for three weeks he was there, and he talked with them in the synagogue from the scriptures. And verse, let me read verse 3. It says, He explained to them and proved that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And he said to them, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. So what Paul's habit was to do would be to go into the synagogue and based on all of the Old Testament scriptures in the Torah and in the prophets and in the Psalms, using all of those, he would say, look, all of this points to Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. And so he was showing all of the Jews and the Gentiles who were in the synagogue that Jesus is the Christ. And it says in there, some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. Okay, that's the word envy, the same word that's used in 1 Corinthians 13. They were envious. They were jealous. And it said that the Jews took some of the wicked men of the city and they they, they, they stirred up all of the people in the city against Paul and Silas. And that word envy, it means to have strong feelings, to have strong desires, to want something so, so strongly. But it can be used also in a, it, it can be used in, in a negative sense as we see here and in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, but can also be used in a positive sense. We'll look at that in just a minute. But it says in 1 Corinthians 13, love does not envy. Love does not have those strong desires which would hinder a relationship. The word envy, if we look at the, 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 the basic meaning of the Greek word, it means to desire something very, very strongly. And it, it's actually used in positive ways in different parts of the Bible where... where um, Paul is talking about eagerly desire spiritual gifts. That's the same word, to desire something strongly. But in this case, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's talking about the negative side of things. Don't envy. When we're thinking about love and we're thinking about relationships, how can envy get in the way of a relationship, of a love relationship? So when we're talking about love, it's a relationship between two people, okay? Love does not envy. Why is envy such an important thing to say, don't envy if you want to have that love, that agape love, that, that good relationship with people? How do we make sure that we don't envy? And why do we make sure that we uh, don't have envy in our relationship? Well, let's think about it for a minute. If there is envy between two people, okay? Maybe, maybe I, I have a relationship with somebody. I have a good friendship with them. We've been friends for a, a number of years. And then I start to envy something that they have. Envy does two things, okay? Maybe let's say, for example, they... They're, they get blessed, and maybe they get a gift from somebody in their family, and they get a new car. Okay, let's just say, for example, I have a choice at that moment to celebrate with them, or maybe I can start to feel envious. Or, oh, man, they got a new car. Why didn't I get a new car? 
I deserve a new car too. Look at them, they're so happy with their new car. It makes them look like the, the great, happy family, the kids in the back seat, everybody's happy. Oh man, I don't have a car. Hmm. They're better than me. Maybe if I get a new car, I'll be happy too. They, they have that, that nice car. Look at my car. It's old, it's beat up, it's, the doors don't close right. It leaks gas out at the bottom. I have all these problems. So what does that do for my relationship with that person? Now, number one, there is something. I have put the car in between my relationship with that person. So now, because I am envious, I can't have a good relationship with them because I'm jealous of what they have. So the first thing that it does is it places something in between or some situation or some life circumstance between me and that person. And I can't love them truly because now there is this thing between them and me. I have these strong desires, these strong feelings, this strong jealousy because they have something and I don't. Envy also affects our relationship with God. Because now you start, a person who is envious starts to look at other people and think, God, why didn't you bless me like you're blessing them? It starts to doubt God's provision for you when you're envious of somebody else. And so that's how envy destroys relationships. It gets in the way. Rather than being happy for your friend, now you're sad for yourself because you don't have what they have. It's not showing love. It's, it's selfish thinking. It's just thinking about me, and it's not thinking about what other people think, what other people need in their lives. So love does not envy. Envy and coveting allows things to separate relationships. We're not giving glory to God for his provision. We're not thanking God. Now we're blaming God that he, didn't, that he didn't give us what the other people have. And so now it gets in the way of that relationship that you have with God because you're saying, God, it's your fault that I'm not blessed like them. And it destroys our relationship with God. So how do we get out of the trap of envy and covetousness? Let's read a couple verses. Luke 12, verse 15. Jesus said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. A lot of the times when we're envious, it's because somebody has something that we don't have. And they have this I want that, I want a life like them, I want blessings like them, I want this, I want, I want, I want. Life, Jesus says here, life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions and the things that we have. James 4, verses 1 to 3. Listen to what it says here. What causes quarrels and fights among you? So James is asking him, think about it for a minute. He's saying to them, everybody think about it. What's the thing that causes fights and quarrels? He says, is it not this, that your passions are at, at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So James says here, he says, why is everybody fighting? I'll tell you why, he says. Because you're coveting. You want what they want. You're not satisfied. You're not thankful. You're not 
living in, in contentment, like the Bible tells us to. And so James is like, stop it. Don't have envy. Don't covet. Because if you want to love, you'll be free from envy. So there's two secrets to contentment. Contentment is the opposite of envy and covetousness is being satisfied with what we have. The first one is know that God is with you. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content. Okay, so don't love money, be content. But listen to what it says. It continues on here. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We talk about that a lot. We say, yeah, God will never leave me or forsake me. God will be with you all the time. But the first part of the verse, it says, be content. Why? Because I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can be content because God is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. He's not going to forget about us. He provides for us. He's with us. He's involved in every situation of our lives. He knows what we need. So we can be content and say, God, all right, I don't need what they have. I'm going to rejoice because you have provided greatly for them. And I'm going to rejoice with those who rejoice, just like the Bible says. And so we can change our attitude from envy to joy with other people. And that's what love does. Because if we say, if someone, you know, our friend, they say, okay, I got this great thing. And you're, you're like, they're all miserable because I, I didn't get what they got. I'm just thinking about myself. Then that destroys our relationship. But if you can say, oh man, I'm so happy for you and say it out of true joy and true love for them. Man, I'm so glad that God has blessed you. I'm so happy for you. Boy, that'll change our relationship. That, that brings us closer together with that person because now we are rejoicing in their joy as well. And that's what God wants. The other thing that helps us to be free from envy and covetousness is thankfulness. When we can just say, okay, God, I am thankful. Thank you for this car that I have. Thank you for my situation. Thank you for how you've provided for me. And when we are thankful, we get our eyes off of what we don't have and we see what we really do have. And that's a key to being free from envy. So love does not envy. 1 Corinthians 13 also says love does not boast and love is not proud. I'm going to put these, both of these together in just in talking about pride and how we can be free from pride. Boasting talks about how I am something great, lifting myself up. Pride is thinking, literally, it means to be puffed up, to say, yep, I'm better, I'm great, I'm good, I'm awesome, okay? And, 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 and 1 Corinthians 13 says, love doesn't boast, love isn't proud, isn't thinking that I'm greater than anybody else, but we can live a life of humility. That's what God wants us to live. This word pride, love is not proud. It means to be blown up or to be puffed up, kind of like a balloon. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm something greater than I really am. This word is used seven times in the New Testament. Seven times. Six of those times are in 1 Corinthians. It's in 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Okay, so Paul was addressing something in the Corinthian church here. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 tells us that some, of the, some in the Corinthian church are adding to what is written in the Bible and as a result are filled with pride like the Pharisees. So the Pharisees would add to the scriptures, add to the law, 
and they would say, you have to do this, this, this. The law says this, but in order to be a good Jew, you have to do this, 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 and this too. And that was what was happening in the Corinthian church, and as a result, they were being filled with pride. It also says they were filled with pride because Paul wasn't coming to their church, 1 Corinthians 4, 18 and 19. There was also some other uh, situations that were going on that caused pride in their church. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Love is not proud. It doesn't lift, our, lift themselves up. It doesn't think, I'm greater than somebody else. I'm, I'm more important. I'm not trying to get more than I really am. Okay, if you think about a balloon, a balloon is really, really small. When you blow into it, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it actually gets bigger than it really is. That's the same thing with pride. Pride lifts ourselves up and makes ourselves bigger and more important than we really are. It's just trying to get attention for ourselves. Boasting in pride also separate relationships because it is lifting oneself up above another. Similar to envy, where you're comparing with somebody else's situation or what somebody else has. Pride compares with somebody else's value. Okay? So envy compares with what someone else has. Pride compares with someone else's value. And pride says, I am more valuable, or it gives more value to yourself than you really should be having. Romans 12, verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of, him, of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think but to think of yourself with sober judgment. That means understand the truth. We're not, Christians aren't a bunch of people who just kind of say, oh, woe is me, I'm nothing. No, that's not, that's not how God sees us. We are children of the king. God, we're bought with a price. We have value because God values us. But this verse is saying, don't think of yourself, don't think of yourself as something greater than what you really are. Don't think, yeah, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, because I do this, I do that. I'm seen in the church, or I do this so people know I'm more important, do this, this. No, don't think of yourself like that. But don't think of yourself as so lowly, but think of yourself, like the Bible says, with sober judgment. It means with right thinking. Think of yourself with right thinking. Okay? Give yourself the value that God values you. Okay? Each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. I love that part of the verse where it says, think of yourself with faith. So faith says, this is who God is to me. This is how God values me. This is my true understanding. Even though I might not feel valuable, God values me and God sees me no matter what situation I'm in. But it doesn't think too highly either. It doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm greater than everybody else because I've done this or I have this position or this or that. No. So it thinks evenly. It says, this is the truth. And I'm going to have faith in the truth of the word of God. In our relationships and in our love, we must be sure that we don't envy, and that we don't boast, or we're filled with pride. All of these things get in the way of our relationships, and it gets in the way of love. You think of boasting. You know, sometimes we, we have conversations with people, and you, have, you tell a story, and someone says, yeah, well, my story is better than your story. And they start saying, oh, you know, this and this and this and that. And, and sometimes it's a way of saying that I'm better. No, just, just be patient and listen to people. Rejoice with them. Think soberly. Think with sober judgment. Think, th think of the way that God sees us and the way that God values us. When we think this way, 
with right thinking, without boasting, without pride, it evens, it evens things out so that we can have a relationship with others. If you lift yourself up, then people, they can't approach you. They can't come to you because you think you're so much greater or so much better. No, let's say no. God sees us. We're equal. We're both valuable in God's sight. And so the least of us to the greatest of us are equal, and we can have those open relationships with people. Don't think of yourself too lowly either. Some people out there, we think, yeah, I'm not that great. I'm not that talented. I'm not that valuable. No, think of yourself with faith. Think of yourself the way that God sees you, the way that God values you. Think with the sober judgment. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Let's make a commitment to God. Say, God, I don't want any of those things in my life. I want true love. I don't want anything getting in the way of my relationship with others. I don't want things and envy of things to get in the way. I don't want my boasting, the words I say, the, the attitudes that I have, the, the value that I give to myself. I don't want that to get in the way of my relationship with others. The pride. I don't want the pride to get in the way. I don't want to think that I'm too good to talk to somebody. I don't want to think that I'm too this or I'm too that. No, I want to have that love relationship with people. I want to be open. I want to be available. I don't want to be too pri pr uh, full of pride so that people can't approach me. No, God wants us. You know, you know, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus, how, you know, he lived. He wasn't proud. They say that he was someone so relatable, you, you probably wouldn't even recognize him. He didn't lift himself up. He didn't say, yeah, look at me, I'm great, I came from heaven. No, he had dinner with sinners and tax collectors, the people that were just kind of the, 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 the people who were looked down on. Jesus said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that open love relationship with people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend time with them. I'm going to show love to them because they're valuable too. Let's be like Jesus. Let's have that closeness with people. Let's have that love in our lives, eliminating all of those things that get in the way, and be people who show love to everybody who's around us. The last thing that we can do in order to eliminate pride in our lives, spend time in worship. Spend time in worship. Jesus is the one who deserves the highest place above all. Not you, not me. Jesus does. And when we get our eyes on him and see him and put him in the rightful place, we can lift our hands. The pride goes away. We lift our hands and we say, you are the king. You are in control. You are the Savior, not me. I've, I couldn't do it, only you. I'm in need of a Savior. You're in need of a Savior. We all need, let's worship together. And when we lift Jesus up, when we worship him and put him in the rightful place, just like we were doing earlier today, then we can live in love. We can say to people, come, come join me as we worship Jesus together. That's not pride. That's showing love because you're leading people to the lover of their souls, Jesus. So let's be people who do that together. Eliminate the envy. God loves us all equally. God's intimately involved in your life. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Put away boasting. We don't have to think about how great we are. We don't have to tell people how awesome we are. No, no. Think of yourself with sober judgment and lift Jesus up. Pride will melt away as you say, Jesus, you're the king. Not me, you. Let's pray together.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that tells us love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. And God, sometimes, to tell you the truth, sometimes we do let envy creep in. We do let boasting and pride creep in. Sometimes we boast because we're insecure. We don't want people to look down on us. We want to feel that we're important. God, please forgive us for that. We don't want anything to get in, our, in the way of our relationship with you. We don't want anything to get in the way of our relationship with others. God, we want to show love to a world that is lacking love. And maybe it's the person in the market that you want us to talk to. Maybe it's the person in our neighborhood that you want us to talk to. Help us to live without love, or with love, without envy, without boasting, without pride. God, we ask you, by the help of the Holy Spirit this week, work within us. Reveal those things to us in our lives where we need to grow, where we need to let you be the Lord, where you need to move and shape and change us so that we can show your love more purely, more truly to those who are around us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.